reminder that this Sunday after church, we will have um, at 2 o'clock, for anyone interested, we're going to be meeting at the Streeter Baptist Camp for fishing at 2 o'clock. And then around 5 o'clock, we're going to grill some hot dogs and some. we'll have some chips. And uh, someone's asked if we're going to bring anything. I know that Katie said she's going to make some potato salad. And so if you want to bring something, you can, but you don't have to as well. we'll but we'll have just a, a, we'll grill some hot dogs and stuff around 5, we'll eat around maybe 5.30 or so. And then we'll have a campfire that night, um, hope we do some s'mores, and um, maybe even do a hayride that night as well. Um, and so again, that's, that's Sunday, just a reminder for those that are either here or online, plan on joining us. If there's uh, rain. If there's rain, we'll probably look to reschedule. Yep. Yeah. We'll, look, we'll announce that. So make sure you worship with us on Sunday so yeah. that you know. Inside. But I haven't watched the forecast. I don't know if there's rain forecasted for Sunday. Or is there? Oh, I see. Yes. 60%. 60%. That's a 40% chance of sunshine. That's what that good. means. That's right. So, very good. Zig Ziglar used to say that everyone's so pessimistic. Even the, even the weatherman gets into it. He says 30% chance of rain instead of 70% chance of sunshine. Oh, <laughs> that's good. So, very good. Well, join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this night where we can gather midweek and just pause and reflect on your word. And I thank you for songs that we sing to sing praises to you, Lord. Help our hearts be that of worship tonight. Lord, use the scripture. Use the scripture to challenge us tonight. Be with those who aren't here. Be with those who are listening online. And be with those that are present. Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever stopped and thought, why me? Why did God choose me to be his child? Tonight I want to talk about being part of God's family. I want you to think about the joys of being part of God's family. Now I wish I could say, as some universalist would say, that everybody is in the family of God. That, that God is the father of everyone. And that we're all brothers and sisters in, in, under, on planet Earth. But we can't really say that. If I, if I were to say that, I would be misleading. I would, I would, be, I would be teaching something other than what the Bible teaches. The Bible never teaches that, that God is the father of every person on planet Earth, that we're all brothers. It, it teaches something else. If, if you, if, as we look at this topic, we should understand that the Bible doesn't teach what's called universal brotherhood of man, which, meaning that we're all God's children. What it teaches in the Bible is universal neighborhood of man. It, it sounds similar, but it's a little different. Neighborhood means that, that we are all God's creatures, right? We're not... We, um, not children, but we're all God's creatures. We're all, we're all God's creation. We're all in this global neighborhood together, and, and we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that, that's what Jesus taught. But there are some people who are in the family of God, and there are some people who are not in the family of God. Now, some of you might say, well, that's narrow-minded. It can sound like you're being a religious bigot, but, but that's exactly what Jesus taught. And if you believe his word, then that's what you're going to believe. If you look at John 8, chapter 8, verses 42 to 44, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come of my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to the father of the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holy to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, according to Jesus, there is not one human family. There's two. There are those, again, who are in the family of God, who have been born into that family of God. They're, they're adopted into that family of God. That's what we're going to talk about more in a little bit. But then there are those that are the sons and the daughters of Adam, the Children that Jesus would say are of the devil. So you're in one of these two families. And, and it's my desire, it's my hope, my prayer that everyone listening to this message, if you're not already in that family of God, that you would make arrangements to become part of his family. <clears throat> We're in Romans uh, chapter 8 tonight. We're starting in verse 12. Uh, starting in verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. 
I'll stop for a moment right there. As, as I'm preaching verse by verse through Romans, I, I've said before that you never start reading with the word, therefore. You always have to stop. You have to, to look ahead or behind and see what the therefore is, therefore, right? And so, what is said in verse 12, four times prior, it talks about God lives in you. It talks about the Holy Spirit living in you. And it says, we are indwelt by the Spirit. And so then, again, we're back to verse 12. And it says, therefore... Because God lives in you, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, because we're indwelt by the Spirit. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. Verses, um, continuing on 13 and 14, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now, children also could be written, it could have been written, sons and daughters of God. Continuing on in 15, it says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Again, rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Notice in the footnotes, um, about, if you look at the footnotes, when it talks about sonship, it, it's um, talking about adoption. That's a, that's a better translation. It's a great translation. You receive the spirit... Of adoption is talking about. Continuing, it says, And in him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. I truly believe that the Christian life is meant to be enjoyed. It's not meant to just be endured. There are many people who are just enduring religion, and for them it's not a joy. It's something they have to, to make themselves do, right? Um, and I want you to hear it's not right. The, the Christian life should be enjoyed. I want you to think back to a movie. A movie that most of you have probably seen a long time ago. An old Disney movie called Pollyanna. Do you guys remember that movie? It's been a long time, I know, for most. But in that movie, there's, there's a little girl who is so positive, and she ends up influencing the entire community. In the movie, there's a preacher. Every Sunday, this preacher preaches this harsh, this hard sermon, and they're so negative that, that people, when they get out of there, their stomachs are hurting, that they can't even enjoy their Sunday lunch because they're so upset. That's what religion is to them. Well, Pollyanna, she, she comes to this town. She's the daughter of a missionary that, that has died. And, and she challenges the pastor. She says to him, have you ever considered using the glad text? The preacher says, what do you mean the glad text? What is this glad text? And she says, well, there, there's over 700 passages in the Bible that speaks about joy, being glad in the Lord and rejoicing. And if you've ever seen the movie, you know that the, the preacher ends up being transformed and he begins preaching positive messages. I think Pollyanna has it right. There's so much in the Bible for us to be rejoicing about. One of the things today that I want to talk to you about that should cause us to rejoice is that we are in the family of God. Then, and that's to be enjoyed again, not endured. Tonight I want us to see four things from this passage that, that we can enjoy as children of God. Number one. As children of God, we enjoy guidance. Now, not only are these benefits, these are also proofs that we're in the family of God. So we're looking at verse 14. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I mean, that if you're being led by the Spirit of God, you are a child of God. But if, if you're not experiencing that leadership of the Lord in your life, you have to question, am I in the family of God or not? Now, I wish that, that God made it easy for us. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if when someone became a Christian, that, that God would just stamp something on their forehead, a sign, right? And we can see that person is truly born again. You can... He says you need to look for, for certain evidence. And one of those evidences he gives, or proofs he gives, in the Bible, is in the Bible. He says, a person who is led by the Lord is a child of God. And again, if you're not led by the Lord, you're not in his family. 
There's two pictures here about, about being guided by the Lord. First of all, there's a truth in the Bible that says God's sheep recognize his voice. In John 10, 26 and 27, Jesus says, But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Back in the time of Jesus, shepherds would often shepherds would bring their flocks together, and they'd bring several shepherds. Sometimes seven or eight different shepherds would bring their flocks together, and they would all mingle their sheep together. It was easier. They could, they could manage them together. They could fellowship together. And you'd have all these sheep together. And when they were ready to separate again, or when one shepherd was ready to separate, he could walk into that, that mixed group of sheep, and he could call his sheep. Now, I don't know what he said. Did he say, here's sheep? Or did he, did he say, come follow me? Did he just make some sound? I don't know what the calling of his sheep sounded like. But he would say something, and the sheep would recognize his voice. And when he turned to walk out of that area, when he turned to leave, the sheep that were his would turn, and they would follow him. It's a way that people could identify which sheep belonged to which shepherd. So what Jesus is saying here is, is, listen, if you're a child of God, if you belong to the flock of the good shepherd, when he speaks, you recognize his voice and you follow him. So I want to ask something very private, very personal. When God speaks, do you recognize his voice? Do you know for sure when God is speaking? And when he speaks, do you follow him? The Bible says his sheep are going to recognize his voice. But the second thing we learn about guidance, it says God's children follow his spirit. In verse 14 we read, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. You ever heard a Christian make a statement like, you know, I, I just felt led by the Lord to do this. I felt led by the Lord to pray for you. I felt led by the Lord to, to give some money to this, to, maybe to encourage you. I felt led by the Lord too, and you can fill in the blank. It's common to hear that in church, isn't it? And for a non-Christian, it might sound strange. But, but if you're a Christian, and you don't feel the guidance from the Holy Spirit in your life from time to time, I would encourage you, examine your life. Examine your salvation. Make sure that you've been saved. Because it's pretty common for us at some point in time to feel that, that nudging. I don't say that lightly. I don't want Christians to doubt salvation, but the Bible teaches that once we are saved, we have eternal security. But notice I said, once we are saved. Make sure you've come to that point where you've placed your faith in Him and Him alone, repenting of your sins and living for Him. Someone recently told me, well, I, I, was, saved, I, 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 was, I was saved when I was, was, was two or three years old. No, that, that's, that's not a salvation experience. You've been dedicated to the Lord. You might have been, been baptized in a different church, but a two-year-old is not capable of making that decision. So examine your life before him. Have you ever, in your life, since God's leading to do something, and if so, followed him? And if you did, it's a good sign that you're a child of God. That's the first benefit you enjoy. It's the first proof. And now here's number two tonight. As children of God... We enjoy adoption. We enjoy adoption. We are adopted into the family of God. Look at verse 15 with me again. It says, The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. The word adoption in, in Greek, um, this is the, I'm sorry, the, the sonship it talks about in this case is the, is the Greek word uh, adoption. It meant a legal transaction to make someone your son. I do remember Paul's writing to the Romans in the first century A.D. and they understood the power of adoption. If you, knew, if you know Roman history, you may remember uh, the emperor Claudius and lived during the first century. Claudius had a son named Britannicus. And Claudius really didn't want his son Britannicus to become the next emperor. So Claudius comes up with the idea he adopts an individual who was not his son, who was actually his nephew. And his name was Nero. He's thinking... My son is not going to be a good leader. My son is not going to do a good job. But Nero, he will do a good job. And so he adopts him to make him his son, thinking it's going to be the great choice. And if you know history, you'll know that he was very, very, very wrong. Nero was nothing of a good leader. But he adopted. He adopted him in his family. And that's the word we're using here. And so, so these people understood adoption. 
We understand what adoption is today. Most of us know someone who, who was or, or uh, was adopted as, or adopted a child or, or maybe someone who's trying to adopt a child. Adoption is a wonderful thing to do. There, there are people in the Bible who were adopted. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, she adopted Moses. Mordecai adopted Esther. Again, adoption is a wonderful thing to do. It's a God-like thing to do. Because it's what God did for us. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It's talking about how God adopts us. Now when the Bible says we are adopted into the family, it talks about at least a couple different things. First of all, the Father lovingly chose us. And we can rejoice because of this. It was his love that caused us to be chosen by him. Again, I asked in the beginning, have you ever stopped and thought, why me? Why did God choose me to be his child? Well, the answer to that question is found in, in the last couple of words that we just read in Ephesians, where it says, in accordance with his pleasure and will. In other words, it happened because it pleased God to do so. It gave him pleasure. It gave him pleasure to choose you to be his child. And when God does something, he does it so he derives personal pleasure from it. And that's why he did it. I read a, about an adopted teenage girl who was talking about being adopted. She said her, her parents had a son, which was just now her, her younger brother. And that, that, that was um, by normal means, she said. But she said, she said, I always felt like I am very special. Because with my brother, when he was born, they had to take what they got. But for me, she said, I realized that they chose me. They chose me to be their daughter. And it's made me feel special. Isn't that a great image? It's a great reminder that adopted does not mean second class. Adopted means someone who is very precious, who was chosen by the parents. It's legal. It's permanent. It's a bond that should not ever be broken. And if you're in the family of God, you are adopted. So it means, first of all, his, he lovingly chose us. But number two, it also means he legally claims us. He legally chains, chain, uh, claims us as his child, and, and therefore we are his heirs. Ever notice how parents, most of the time, like claiming their children? When kids are together, maybe, they're, maybe kids are playing sports or, or they're doing a play or something. The, the parents are all watching this performance, this, this event, and, and when, a kid, when their kids are out front, they'll say something like, there, that's my kid. That's the, the one in the blue or the one doing something. They'll point them out. They claim their kids. They're saying, I claim that child. That, that child is mine. That I am proud of him or her. Second truth is that God loves us so much he wanted to legally embrace us. That's why this terminology, adoption, is used for us. We, we become his heirs. Look at verse 16 and 17 again. It says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children, for God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share, notice this is our inheritance, we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, we're quick to, to want to take the glory part of that, right? But we want to overlook the suffering part a lot. Something we'll talk more about next week, and that suffering. The, the suffering we endure is nowhere near to be compared to the, the glory that we are going to receive. So what does all that mean? It means that, that God wanted to make sure that, that we knew that legally we receive all he is and all he has. Many of you know that I worked a long time ago as an investment tax lease. 15 plus years ago, I was an investment advisor. And on many occasions, I had clients who had become executors of wills. It means that a parent or some other person, usually a relative, has named them to settle the estate, to, to divide it up properly when they've died. The executor follows the wishes of that person. They sell off the assets as directed. They pay the bills that are needed. They pay the final expenses. And then, then they give to each person listed as an heir, the proper amount of money. Now, most of the time, the, the children of the deceased, they're listed as co-heirs. 
meaning that they each receive the same amount. So if there's $30,000 exactly left and there's three kids at the end, then they each receive $10,000 because they are co-heirs. Now remember, the Bible says that we are co-heirs with Christ. Everything that God is and everything he has, we are heirs to that. And you are a child of the king. It's something we should be excited about. So again, number one, we're guided by the Lord. And number two, we are adopted by the Lord. And here's the third wonderful benefit, but again, also the proof. As a child of God, we enjoy intimacy. Think about the word intimacy for a while. When you think of this word, what do you think about? You're probably thinking about loving someone. Most of the time we use it in a, in a love, in a romantic kind of relationship. For example, I have a level of intimacy with my wife that I have with no one else. Because we know each other well. We have intimacy. We address each other differently than we do other people. We express our love for one another. Same for my children. There's an intimate relationship. The Bible says that you and I, though, as children of God, can have an amazing level of intimacy with the creator of the universe. You ever think about that? That we can have an intimate relationship with the creator of the universe. Look again at the last part of verse 15 where it says, You received... Let me jump over here. You received, brought about your adoption to sonship, and we cried... And in him, by him we cry, Abba, Father. All right, Abba, Father. If you're wondering what Abba is, it's a, it's a personal, intimate address that, that a little baby would, would utter to a parent. It's an Aramaic word. Picture a newborn baby, maybe a few months old or less than a year old, and they're, they're just starting to make a few words. They're beginning to mumble their first word, and and they look to the father or the mother and they say, Abba, Abba. It'd be the equivalent of like when a, when a little child says, Dada, Dada. Or some people say, Papa. Or it's like saying Dada or Daddy. It's the most basic baby talk. But it's a term of endearment in any language. It's amazing that, that in the Bible, this word is used. That we can cry, Abba, to, to God. I want to learn a couple things about this word, Abba. First of all, Jesus was the first to call God Abba. This word is only found three times in the entire Bible. And the first one's in Mark 14, 36. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying before he was crucified. He's distressed. He's burdened. Frankly, he wasn't too certain about what's going to happen. In verse 36, it says, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. You understand that, that none of the Jews or in the Old Testament ever would call God Abba. They wouldn't say a term like Daddy. These are refer there are references in the Old Testament of God being Father, and we find that in the New Testament as well. But, but and Jesus, Jesus even tells us that when we, when we pray, we're to say, Our Father, which art in heaven. But that's more of a formal word. Father is more for formal. Uh, pateras is the Greek word in that. We get our word paternity or patriarch from that word. But here, Jesus is using that baby talk term. That term of affection to God when he's praying. It, it's remarkable. In the Old Testament, the Jews were afraid, afraid to even speak the name of God. It's, it's why when they came to the word that we translate as Yahweh in the Old Testament, they would not even speak it. They would, they would substitute another word because... They had a sense of God being so remote, so holy, that they wouldn't even speak this name. So they're afraid to say the name. And then imagine the disciples listening as Jesus fell on his face in the Garden of Gethsemane. He turns his face to heaven, he, the creator of the universe, and he says, Daddy, help me. It's a level of intimacy that, that they had never experienced, they had never seen before. And the amazing thing is that the Bible says you and I can have that same level of intimacy with the creator of the universe. 
In Christ, we can cry, Abba. Second thing about the word Abba. You and I can say, God, you are Abba. Again, we can know him intimately. Jesus was distressed when we first see him calling out this name. But I think the key word here is you look at verse 15 where it says, And by him we cry, Abba. It's an unusual phrase, to cry, isn't it? The word cry is almost like a distress or a cry of pain. In the, in the word Jesus used, when, it's the word Jesus used when he said, If you don't praise me, the, the rocks will cry out with praise. It's a word used when Jesus was dying on the cross and he, he gave out a, a great cry and gave up the Spirit. It's the same word. So when it says, cry Abba, it doesn't mean you just walk into the presence of God and, hey Dad, how you doing? No. It means there are times in our lives where we are so burdened, we're hurting, we're so distressed that we literally cry out, Abba, Abba. Have you ever been so lonely? So lonely where you thought you were the only person on the face of the earth. At those times that you can, you can get to on your face and you can say, Abba, I'm lonely. You ever been in a lot of pain, so much pain that you thought you'd never get relief. You, you can fall to your knees and you can cry, Abba, I'm hurting. You ever been discouraged? Discouraged to the point that you're not sure you can get up in the morning or the next or even the next week or the next month and it's just driving you crazy. When you're discouraged, you can fall to your face and say, Abba, I need your help. You see, what God is trying to say here is that when you're in his family, you can have a level of intimacy with him that is beyond human reason. I ask, do you have that? Do you feel close enough to God that you can say, Abba, when you're hurting? It's one of the privileges we have as children of God. It's also one of the proofs again. And the fourth thing tonight. The fourth thing, as children of God, we enjoy assurance. You can know that you are saved. Think about all these benefits. You are guided by God. You are adopted by God. You have an intimate relationship with God. And you have the benefit of assurance. Of assurance of salvation. Now, if I were to ask you, are you saved? You can say yes. You may say, I hope so, or I think so, some people might say. But I want you to know it's a birthright. It's a heritage. Every child of God should know for certain that they are a child of God. To have total, full assurance of salvation. And some people say, well, can you absolutely really know and be sure? Absolutely. I truly believe you can know for certain. Not only can you know you're saved, but you can know that you know that you are saved. You can come to such a total, absolute assurance that you are a child of God that nothing can shake that. If you don't have that assurance right now, either, either you truly need to be saved yet, which could be a problem, could be what the situation is, or the problem is that you may have never come to the place of full assurance. Where you say with confidence, I know in whom I have believed. And I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. There's an external witness in God's word. How can you know? Well, first of all, two witnesses. First of all, again, there's this external witness. The external witness, which is the word of God. God's word tells us how we can know that we are saved. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Listen to this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If someone comes up to you and they say, well, you, know, you can't know for certain that you're saved. You can open your Bible to 1 John 5 and look at 11 to 13 and say, no, you can know. You can know for sure. Look at this passage. It's this external witness of the word. It says that if you turn from your sins, that you put your faith in Jesus, you can know that you will be a child of God. But there's also a second one. That's what this verse in Romans that we're reading tonight is talking about. There's an internal witness. That's the Spirit of God. It says in verse 16, The Spirit himself 
testifies with our spirit that we are, and notice it doesn't say that, that we uh, might be, that we, that we uh, may be. It says we are God's children. What does that mean? It means that, that when you become children, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And the, your, home, your human spirit says, I'm a child of God. The Holy Spirit rises up in you and says, Amen, glory, hallelujah. In other words, you should have this inner spirit, this inner sense of the presence of God. This internal witness, God's spirit. That's why when a, when a Christian is out of fellowship with God, and maybe they, they walked away or they stumbled away, they got into an area they shouldn't, that, that they have this inner sense that they're not doing what they should be doing. That they're still part of the family of God. That they're, that they're disappointing the Heavenly Father. It's an inner tugging of the Spirit to draw them back to the heart of God. That's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. If you're in the family of God, you have both the external witness and the internal witness. And you can have that assurance and never know. Again, it's a birthright. It's a heritage. And it's a privilege of being part of of the family of God. So as we get ready to close, let me ask a question. Do you know who your biological parents are or were? Most of you know, right? Most people. Of course you do. You live with them. Maybe they raised you. They, 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 you loved them. They loved you. There's no doubt who your parents were. You were part of that family, or you are part of that family. When someone asks you, if you're part of that family, you would say, yes, I am part of that family. That's my mom. That's my dad. Well, when somebody asks you if you're part of the family of God, don't say, I hope so. Don't say, I think so. You need to know so. Problem is, I think that, that, that part of the family of God, there are people who are not enjoying the benefits of. When I served as a missionary in Czech Republic, I, I went with a group of pastors to Turkey to work with the churches there. And Turkey had just recently formed its first Baptist union. This, this group of union, it was a group of, I think, 13 or 14 churches had joined together voluntarily, working toward the same cause. Now, many of those churches were, were hidden, and there's all kinds of things. We talk more about the churches another day in Turkey and what that looked like. But, but before we went there, a friend, another Czech pastor, he went there prior to kind of line things up to try to figure out what that trip was going to look like. And he, again, he went there by himself. Um, he went with, he met with the union leadership. And he told me, when I, I roomed with him when I went to Turkey, and he, he told me about, about the hotel they put him in when he met with the Baptist Union. Apparently it was a really, really, really nice hotel. Um, kind of the hotels we see in movies a lot of times. But, and this hotel, you know, he got to his room. There was an air conditioner in his room. Not all, not all hotels in Turkey had air conditioning. And, and then at breakfast, there was this huge buffet of all kinds of food. The problem was, my dear friend, you know, at home, he didn't have air conditioning. And he was afraid that cold air in that room might make him sick. And so that night, he slept with the window open. He had trouble sleeping in the hot air. Plus, he's in a very, very busy, busy city with millions and millions of people. It's so loud that the, the noise of the road, the noise of the people kept him awake through the night with the window. <coughs> and then in the morning, he went down to eat some breakfast, and he sees there's all this food out there, but he doesn't recognize any of it. It's strange to him. And so he eats some bread, and he eats some piece, oh, one little piece of the cheese that was there. Now, he could have went to that room, and he could have set the temperature to anything he wanted. He could have ate all the various fruits. He could have ate the meats that were there, all the prepared dishes. But instead, he missed out on those benefits. Sad, isn't it? But you know what's worse? Many people in the family of God aren't enjoying the benefits of being a part of that family. People are content to, to nibble on the bread or a small piece of cheese to, to lie awake at night worrying instead of being in comfort. When God has told us that you are heirs to all the glories of heaven. He says, I'll spread a banquet in front of you in the, in the presence of your enemies. And you can address me as Abba. 
today. Folks, if you've not yet become a child of God, do so. Don't put it off. Call out to Him. Repent of your sins and live for Him. Christians, we need to start enjoying who we are as children of God. Join with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this text tonight that reminds us that we are adopted, that we are heirs, no heirs in Christ. <coughs> that we can come to you as Abba. We can call out to you in need as an intimate relationship that we have with you, Lord. Lord, help us all to model that in our lives, trusting you, living a joyful Christian life, not walking around and in gloom and despair, but rejoicing in the assurance we have of being children of God. For any that are listening that don't know you, I pray that they would look at this text and they would examine their life and if they don't see those evidences of you in their life, that this would be the time that they would repent and become children of God. They would become part of that family. <coughs> Lord, guide, direct hearts. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh. Uh -huh.